was motivating over the hill. I saw Maybelline and a coupe de ville. A Cadillac rolling on an open road. Nothing out to run my V8 Ford. A Cadillac doing about 95. We bumper to bumper rolling side to side. Maybelline. Well, my camera died. The battery went completely dead. I couldn't find the charger. It took me like two days to find a place that sold the charger. In the meantime, I did do some work. Uh, I didn't get too carried away so that I could remember everything. Some of the engines have been pulled apart more. I've put it back on slightly so that I can recreate taking it off because I realized that people might not know how everything works. I don't know a lot, so whenever I already know something, I assume everybody knows it, kind of. Uh, so I'll just show how everything came apart and where I'm at with the current teardown. The next video will hopefully be identification of parts to figure out what I've got. And that's a whole <laughs> ridiculous mess in itself that so it deserves its own video. So for this video, I will show how things have come apart on the engine, I'm trying to get it down to just the block. Well, here it is, as it, uh, as it stands. We have the block, the heads on, the manifold on, pretend the distributor is in it, and the harmonic balancer up front. You saw earlier how we hand cranked the crank. This is the harmonic balancer. Should take that off first. I got this bolt type wheel puller set from Harbor Freight for, I don't know, it wasn't much. And it did the job after I was shown how to do it correctly. So initially this is on the block like this. I took a breaker bar to this big bolt, smacked it with the hammer till it started turning, because if you just turn it calmly, it'll just keep turning the crank forever and ever. Then after that, this goes on. You select the appropriate bolts for your application which for me were these so I would screw these down here then when you line it up you can move it around to where it lines up with the proper holes which I actually did wrong but then this big bolt you can select one of these stoppers pop in the end and then when all of these three bolts have been put into this, this can be threaded through here and then cranked on with the breaker bar or ratchet or whatever. And as those, as this bar is pulled through the puller, since those are bolted down in the other three places, this wheel pulls off the crank and that's the only way to get it off. It seemed kind of mind blowing to me, just having it explained like that, but once I did it, that did make sense. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If somebody really doesn't get it, uh, I could put it back on and do a demonstration video, but it's just a lot of stuff that I'd rather not put back on if I don't have to. After you've pulled the harmonic balancer, you can then take the timing chain cover off, which is self-explanatory bolts all around. When that comes off, you'll see this. This right here will be fastened in and it looks lopsided because it is. What this does is it turns and it lopes like that, all awkward because there's a arm for the mechanical fuel pump and that's how it pumps fuel. This is the fuel pump, and this is the fuel pump arm that gets pushed up and down. If you have an electronic fuel pump, then you can just take this off and pop a spacer in there. But that is unique to Ford. Chevy is all done internally, apparently. So my dad tells me. I took a, a bag and wrote timing on it, so all the timing cover components go into this bag. The dipstick, you can just yank right out of the side. Uh, Dad told me to, you know, put it off somewhere where it wouldn't get bent and messed up, so naturally I proceeded to immediately lose it, otherwise I'd show you exactly how it pops off. But yeah, just, you know, grab and yank. I'm sure most of you can figure that out. You know what I'm saying. So at this point, the uh, distributor 
would be right down in this hole. It's really easy to take out. You take this bolt off of the retainer plate. That plate is off. And then the distributor just twists it and it comes right out. That hooks down to the bottom. Of course, I've taken the oil pan off the bottom, which is also self-explanatory. You just take the bolts off and hit it with the rubber mallet and it'll fall right off. And up inside, hanging down off the engine, which you might have seen in an earlier video, this oil pump just hangs down underneath here and the pickup goes down to the deep part of the pan. Now that arm coming off the oil pump goes up through a passage in the block and connects the distributor right there so it's not uncommon when you pull these pans to find some some of these dropped rods down there where somebody has not been careful and dropped the rod down I had one down there that I had dropped so whenever you pull the distributor out and you unbolt the fuel pump and the fuel pump comes off and the bottom of the block is clear and straight crankshaft bolts are off I'm gonna try to get down into the camshaft. The idea is to unlock everything that's hooked up around it. Okay, you'll probably recall in the last video, I couldn't take this intake manifold off because the head meets right here and these push rods ran down passages that were actually in the intake manifold as opposed to the head. And it was blowing my mind. My father looked at it for three seconds and then told me how it worked. So these rocker shafts up here, there's four bolts that have them secured down. You unbolt these four bolts and then the entire rocker shaft assembly just pops right off like that. At this point, the push rods are all sticking up and you just pull them out. Since I'm not getting into the heads yet, I'm not pulling those off yet. I just kept this plate and the shaft assemblies all together, put it back down, and then bolted them back down so that it's out of my way and not a component that I have on the floor that I'm tripping over. But since I have the rocker arms, or excuse me, the uh, push rods out, I don't know how many times I called this a rocker arm instead of a push rod. This is a push rod, these are rocker arms push rod rocker arms sorry but now that these push rods are not sticking through attaching the head to the manifold I can lift this big heavy manifold off which is another story all the bolts were prior removed facing down in the manifold one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so I guess there were ten that were bolting the manifold down to the block actually mainly bolting it to the head there was a thermostat housing here that I took off as well. You might not want to do that until you've gotten it off because this thing is heavy. It weighs like 70 pounds. So you can hold it by that. <clears throat> the way that I ended up doing it, you would think that this was on there pretty good, but it's just mainly held down there by weight. So I'm not reusing this. I'll probably sell it again. I don't know if this is advisable often, but I just took a small ball peen used it as a lever, grabbed it by that housing, and just yanked it up like that, just to get it to move. I wouldn't carry it around by the hammer, but that pulled it up. Now you can see that the inside workings of the heads are exposed. So, you pull this completely out, Set it down, and it is really, really heavy. <sighs> this is where you can tell how regular your oil changes have been. That gunky stuff is bad. I've always heard it called baby shit, but I was told that they've seen worse. They've seen this all over the engine. When you first open this up, there's supposed to be a pan that covers all of this. I don't know what it's called. People have different names for it, and I can't find the official name for it anywhere. But this pan covers the lifters, 
and this part where the oil is slopping through because the oil gets pushed up through the push rod. Each push rod goes from the lifter that connects to the, to the camshaft and then pushes the rocker arm and the oil squirts up through the push rod and lubricates the top end through here. The problem is the manifold is such a big surface here that without something to protect it, the uh, oil gets burnt up to the bottom side of the manifold because manifolds are incredibly hot operating temperature. I've read different things where people say that that whole plate is not necessary because it was mainly because of the old kinds of oils used when the engine was designed. I don't know if that's bullshit or not. People say they have them, people say they don't. <laughs> I didn't know what it was and was told just throw it away, it'll come with a rebuild kit. So I broke mine in half. Uh, I might have to track another one because I'd like to put on what was there. I'm sure it's not there for no reason. If somebody has any better information, feel free to correct me. Anyway, to get the camshaft out, you want to pull these lifters up. I just grabbed them with a the screwdriver, got them up out of the way. Some of them came out, some of them are stuck. Probably could come out with a little bit more convincing, but I was getting tired of it. And then a couple of them are stuck down there. They might have to just be lifted up by hand like this, just to get the uh, camshaft out here in a bit. These lifters have to come out because they are holding down into the journals on the camshaft and everything. And eventually, once those are all out, we can slide the camshaft out. All right, so that's what you missed. The heads are still on. The block still has the crank and cam inside. We can now flip it over and turn it upside down and look at the inside of the engine. But I'm not going to because I'm going to save that for the second part of the whole engine teardown where we'll take off the heads, pull the pistons, pull the camshaft, lift the crankshaft, pull the rods off. The only way that I'm going to be able to ID this is by actually looking at the rods and the crankshaft and seeing casting numbers on them once they're pulled out. I'll explain that in the identification video because it deserves its own, like I said. So there will probably be a identification slash second part tear out or maybe just a second part tear down and then an identification video. But since this was kind of short and sweet for all the topics covered, I think I will show you some of the good stuff that I have acquired since the last video a few days ago. My battery died. Most importantly, I have screwdrivers. Finally, the Lewis household has screwdrivers. The red ones, they are flatheads. The blue ones, they are Phillips heads. And there are big ones and small ones and medium ones. It's terrific. We have screwdrivers. Holy dumb fuck, what is this shit? A nice shiny new tailgate. Thanks, Rock Auto. So, the parts have started rolling in. For new parts, I am sticking mainly with Summit Racing and Rock Auto. Let me see. Uh, Rock Auto. Because Rock Auto is really affordable. I don't know if they're just buying up warehouses or what. Summit Racing has the cool stuff. So over here, we have a rough mock-up of what the underhood will look like with the Edelbrock valve covers, air cleaner, and underneath that, Edelbrock electric carburetor. And I went for this build with something a little less conventional and fun. People will just say cheaper, but I say fun. This intake is a Streetmaster from the 70s, so it's period correct. It's a single plane, which they don't really make anymore for the Edelbrock intakes for these. They have mainly, uh, I mean not the cheap ones anyway, they have expensive single plane, but mostly dual plane now. I think it's going to look cool. I'm thinking about painting the block Ford blue, keeping the, the intake just aluminum like it is, the rest of the stuff black. It's going to look good. Courtesy of Rock Auto, here's what I'm going for with the ignition. The stock distributor you saw earlier, you can get a kit, take the points out, and put an electronic ignition in it. A lot of these kits are like $150. I don't know, I'm sure there's a lot of performance things going on and everything, but I was just thinking, damn, that's, that's a lot. So, you see inside here, this is an electronic ignition. This is a high output coil. A little bit hotter than stock, and this is the electronic ignition control module that you wire in to the distributor and your battery. So all of this together was $90 before shipping, I think, just somewhere around $90, $92 or something like that. That is absolutely a good deal, if you ask me. 
So if you are looking for not so super hopped up race parts, just some kind of nicer OEM or some resto mod stuff like like here where we're taking the points and playing electronic but you don't really need something that's going to breathe fire, uh, Rock Auto has just got all kinds of stuff for a really reasonable price and they have lots of things on closeout and clearance pretty consistently. I've gotten a lot of stuff from there already. Also from Edelbrock and Summit, I have the Performance D-Link Double Roller Timing Chain set up, which is a must. You can see Double Chain, and there's a lot of different options to go with these. Uh, the standard is the Coyer, I figure. Everything else is Edelbrock. I already had free shipping in that car, why not just go all out and have another box that says Edelbrock, because that's what matters, right? Maybe one of the more important things to show that I purchased is my small library. I joked that instead of putting a gun rack in my back window like a, like a good redneck, I should just have a bookshelf. This one's referred to as the FE Bible. A lot of good stuff about overhauling an engine. Only thing is, some of his numbers for identifications, specifically for the 360 to 390, like I needed the book for, um, are in dispute on the internet, so there might be a few things that are wrong here and there, but overall, in the, the approach, it's uh, understandable and, and a good book. The uh, how to repair and rebuild and modify Ford C4 and C6 transmissions, which are the only automatic transmissions that you are going to potentially have. Engine blueprinting, which just kind of explains engine components and how they relate and how to build your engine for different purposes. Ford differentials, the Bible for the 9 inch and 8.8 .8 inch Ford rear ends. And of course, you can get these on eBay from time to time. The guy that I got these from wanted like $50 each for them or best offer. I offered him 15 bucks each and he sold all of them. These are the original factory uh, service manuals which just go an incredible depth about everything that you could imagine on any truck in that year, and I have the ones for 1973. So I have the body electrical, volume one, which is chassis, which is massive, and volume two, engine. So I also have the Haynes, the Chilton manuals or whatever, which are awesome for basic stuff, but between those and all of these, if it's not in there, it's not known. <laughs> well, <clears throat> hopefully, some of you have been enjoying these videos. I've gotten a little bit of feedback that maybe a couple people do and want me to keep making them, so I will. Thanks for watching and putting up with my lack of knowledge.